Hello. Welcome to Microwave Spectroscopy for Non-Invasive Biological and Health Sensing with Katia Grenier. I'm Mike Hamilton, your host for this IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcast, which is sponsored by the MTTS Education Committee. Before we start, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. First, this presentation will be archived. A recording should be posted approximately 24 hours after we finish the presentation. We'll send all registrants an email when the archived webinar goes up so you can revisit it or share it with your colleagues. Second, we encourage questions. We'll answer them after the talk, but you can submit them at any time during the discussion. Enter your question in the Q&A box in the webcast window, and don't forget to click Submit. Third, some words about the interface. You can enlarge slides by clicking on the rectangle at the top right of the slide area. You can also go into full screen mode if you desire. Refresh or reload the current web page if you encounter any problems. With regards to audio, if you're listening over your computer speakers, you may need to adjust the media player volume, or you may also need to adjust your system's master volume. The icons at the bottom of the webinar window include a resource list. Clicking that link will start the process to download copies of the slides that will be presented today. Now let's introduce our speaker. Dr. Katia Grenier received her PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of Toulouse, France in 2000. After a postdoctoral fellowship at Azure Systems in 2001, she joined the Laboratory of Analysis and Architecture of Systems of the National Research, Scientific Research Center in France and was engaged in the development of RF-MEMS circuits on silicon. From 2007 to 2009, she was a visiting researcher with the Laboratory for Integrated Micromechatronic Systems of CNRS and the University of Tokyo in Japan, where she was engaged in launching research activities on miniature microwave and millimeter wave-based biosensors. Since 2009, she has been heading a research group in LLAS-CNRS dedicated to the development of high-frequency and fluidic microwave microsystems her research interests are focused on the interaction of RF electromagnetic waves with complex fluids at the million microscales. This research involves the development of fluidic-based and RF micro nanosystems for biological and medical applications, as well as for reconfigurable wireless systems. She has published more than 190 papers in peer-reviewed journals and conferences. Dr. Grenier is a member of MTTS Technical Committee 10 dedicated to biological effects and medical applications of RF and microwaves. She also serves as a member of the European Microwave Association and as program committee member of several conferences such as the past IEEE BioWireless and the new IEEE International Microwave Bioconference, as well as IMS. Now it's my pleasure to turn the virtual podium over to Dr. Katia Grenier for microwave spectroscopy for non-invasive biological and health sensing. Katia? Thank you very much, Dr. Hamilton, for this nice uh, introduction. So let me start with the presentation uh, of today. So you already saw the, uh, the title. Uh, let me go over. So uh, this work is uh, mainly done in my uh, research group in collaboration with David Dubuc and also uh, with PhD students and also postdoc students that I want to thank uh, right now. Uh, Tong Chen, Thomas Cretieno, François Artis, uh, Wenli Chen, Amar Tamara, Amel Zedek, Guillaume Poirou, and some uh, uh, important collaborators, biologists, uh, such as Barbara Suzini, Marie Poupeau, Jean-Jacques Fournier, and Marie-Pierre Rolls. So let's start uh, directly. Um, here, you can see a drawing where some uh, major analyzing techniques um, involved in biology and medicine are indicated in the bottom. Uh, depending on their uh, frequency range. So in the uh, really high frequency range, you can uh, find uh, the uh, radiography, uh, which is uh, an ionizing uh, technique, but uh, working very nicely and uh, used uh, commonly in hospitals. On the other side, you can uh, find acoustic waves with echography and also um, uh, magnetic resonance imaging at lower frequency. And right in the middle, we can find also all the optical techniques uh, using uh, staining fluorescence techniques uh, for imaging, and mainly done this time with uh, at the cell levels and molecular levels. And uh, 
Finally, um, what I want to stress here is uh, we know a lot about microwaves and RF uh, uh, for communication and data transfer, but uh, finally, would there be a place uh, where we could find a new technique based on microwaves uh, to perform some um, new imaging or giving some um, techniques to biologists and physicians? This is really a, a main question now, what about uh, dielectric, dielectrically analyzing cells uh, with the microwave range and would it be uh, really uh, important for uh, as a new technique? And I will try today to give you some um, important uh, trends and issues of this um, with this presentation. So the idea is not new. In fact, um, uh, using um, uh, electromagnetic waves applied uh, to uh, biological materials for characterization has been done for many years now uh, with the measurement of complex permittivity. So it was done mainly with organs and tissues up to the gigahertz range because the equipments were cumbersome at that time. And uh, one remark I want to highlight today is uh, that it was Unfortunately, not always taking into account the living heterogeneity into account because it was not at this level yet. And um, 10 years ago, finally, we had very nice study from um, uh, the University of uh, Wisconsin Madison uh, who published finally a very nice paper with uh, uh, 85 patient breast tissues that were characterized uh, in the mega microwave range and they demonstrated finally very strong heterogeneity of the tissues, uh, which was due to the disparity of uh, the adipose tissue inside the, the breast. Uh, so this is a nice example that we have to face a strong heterogeneity and we have to take that always in our mind uh, to, to make sure to we, we take that into consideration. Um, another thing is, um, uh, up to now, we were not at this uh, stage with microtechnology, and uh, there was a lack, finally, of characterization and modeling at the cellular and molecular level. It was done with a uh, large quantity of liquids, or uh, I said before, with organs or tissues. So we need really now to go further into this characterization and to be able to uh, have a more complete library of biological materials. Uh, for cells, DNA, proteins, biomolecules, virus, bacteria, and so on. And um, another point, uh, motivation of, the, uh, of this work is also that we could apply our technique to perform cellular analysis, this time for biological and biomedical applications. Right now, um, what they use traditionally are based on optical techniques with microscopy, um, with staining or labeling, also laser detection in flow cytometers, so it's very efficient with a very high specificity, as you can see here on one of the drawing. You, um, you have a picture of cells uh, and inside different colors depicting uh, different um, organites. And, and molecules inside, so it's very precise. But uh, it has, however, some drawbacks. Uh, you are obliged to involve uh, new uh, materials, new molecules inside or outside the cells. So it can be invasive, and it can even be toxic for the cells. Uh, it's also destructive, and uh, it has, um, uh, it needs some time to, to make the molecules um, bind inside the cells or outside on the membrane. So there is really now a big interest in developing non-invasive biological analysis, which could bring some consequences both at the fundamental level and also for therapy. So therapy, because we could then give access to early diagnostic of disease and prognostic, evaluating efficiency very rapidly of treatments directly on patient cells, for instance. Or we could also uh, give uh, a further understanding of biological processes and disease treatment. So let me introduce you now um, the technique itself, microwave dielectric spectroscopy. 
which is simple in fact. Uh, you emit uh, waves uh, which is crossing a biological material. This material is exhibiting uh, its own uh, dielectric properties, uh, so uh, uh, the permittivity, epsilon prime and epsilon double prime. And uh, because of this um, permittivity, uh, the material is modifying the signal that is crossed, cro is crossing the material. And uh, the received signal then is, uh, is changed consequently. So it permits to characterize materials really uh, easily and through their dielectric properties. Uh, so it's very efficient in the, in the sense that it's non-destructive. You can probe really various materials, solids, liquids, gas, so cells and, um, and molecules. Um, it's non-contact. Uh, you don't need any labels. And um, it's also non-invasive for the cells if you are at low power. Um, it's a volumic volume interaction uh, which can occur in liquid, so with a realistic cellular environment. Uh, typically, uh, cells may be monitored and looked at uh, into, into directly into their culture medium. The technique is fast, quasi uh, real-time monitoring possible because our um, um, analyzer can perform measurements. Uh, one, one frequency is less than uh, it's around microseconds, so it's very efficient and quick. And you will see that we can reach a spe certain specificity in the dielectric spectra in the next slide. I already mentioned that now we can also uh, have access to micro and nanotechnologies which uh, run which gives the sensor compatible with cell size and very low liquid volumes, uh, which can be very important. Because sometimes with chemists, you only have very small amount of, uh, of uh, molecules available. And finally, one key point also is that if you use microwaves and millimeter uh, range, you will bypass the lipidic membrane of the cells, and it will uh, allow you to perform intracellular investigations. But I will come back on that later because it's really important. The cons, um, you won't be as precise as you can be with labels, of course, uh, to give an image of the cells uh, like it's possible with optics. Uh, no, we, we can only perform global measurements uh, so far. But, and uh, the second one is that uh, it's also under development, so we need absolutely to define and, uh, the capabilities and the limitation of the technique. Of course, we don't have the maturity yet of the optical techniques, so lots of to, do, to be done now. So about the phenomenon we can look at. Um, in fact, if you look at biological materials in terms of electromagnetic wave interaction, um, so we have the parameter uh, described here, the permittivity versus frequency, which give uh, a spectrum, which is finally quite specific depending on the material that is characterized. And uh, this material is really depending on the dielectric properties. Um, so what we can recognize here is we have different plateaus depending on the frequency range. And between these plateaus, we have what we call dispersions. The first one is the ionic diffusion one, alpha, uh, in the low frequency range. Uh, higher in, in the megahertz range, we can find the beta dispersion, which is uh, linked to the polarization of the cell membrane. Whereas uh, higher in frequency, we can find the gamma dispersion, uh, which is linked to the polarization uh, of uh, dipole orientation, uh, reorientation of the dipole, in fact. And uh, if we go higher, uh, this is not any longer dispersion, but resonances with, uh, which are induced by uh, atomic polarization and electronic polarization, but it's really far in frequency. So, in this talk, uh, I will uh, more specifically uh, uh, show you our results in the microwave range. So typically, it will li be linked to the polarization of dipoles, reorientational. So let's start. In fact, uh, the main dipole we can look at in, micro in the microwave range is uh, water, water molecules. 
um, this is the polar molecule, uh, which is uh, um, working in a, a network structure, structuration with uh, high affinity with uh, lots of molecules and particles, so especially in, in, in cells. And uh, it has a, a specific dielectric signature that you can see, for instance, on the, the right side in blue, uh, which show you uh, epsilon pr um, the real part of permittivity versus frequency up to 40 gigahertz. And we can see in this range that we, we have this gamma dispersion I was uh, uh, mentioning before. And uh, with a, what we call a relaxation frequency in the middle of this slope, um, around the 20 gigahertz, typically. And finally, when you add a chemical, like for instance here, 10% of ethanol, you see that finally this, um, the spectrum is shifting toward the left. Um, and uh, this, in fact, uh, is uh, due to the modification of the molecular network itself. And uh, in fact, you have a modification of the water spectrum uh, shifted. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is the, that water is the main constituent of the living. So uh, it's uh, around 80% in, cell, in cells. And um, it's also involved in many biological mechanisms uh, to make them working. So it's quite nice, in fact, to be in the microwave range because we can use then this, mar this molecule as a natural marker for microwave dielectric spectroscopy. Another key point also is I mentioned that quickly before. At this frequency range, if you look at um, the waves passing through the cells, in fact, the waves can bypass the bilipedic membrane, uh, the capacitive bilipedic membrane. And because of that, we can really have access of the waves inside the cell, which is not so easy and uh, at lower frequency. It's not, it's not uh, possible. Uh, so this is also an important key aspect because we can access to intracellular dielectric activity. So let's speak now about the dielectric readouts. So I mentioned already uh, permittivity, uh, the complex permittivity. In fact, when a signal is passing through a biological object, a solution, cells in suspension or molecules, um, these waves will be uh, modified in terms of attenuation and delay, and uh, both of them are related one for the uh, uh, double, um, epsilon double prime, the imaginary part of the permittivity, and for the delay, it's related to the real part of the permittivity, and both of them are related also to the uh, reason fre reason and fre um, uh, relaxation frequency, FR, in the two equations here. Uh, delta epsilon is finally the levels of the plateau uh, at low and high frequency. So we have two readouts, in fact, uh, which are linked to uh, the dipolar moment of the uh, constituent of the solution, the scanning frequency, of course, and the physical parameters of the objects we are looking at, the size, viscosity, and also temperature. Uh, so let me continue. We developed in our lab uh, a test setup uh, to perform the measurement of permittivity. Uh, so associated then to uh, a sensor. So it's, uh, you have a picture there for this kind of um, setup. With uh, in the back side uh, VNA, Vector Network Analyzer, uh, which you see uh, the four S parameters on the screen behind. And uh, uh, two cables are coming from this VNA and are linked with RF probes to a sensor. And the sensor is, uh, you have a zoom view on the right uh, bottom uh, picture here. Uh, this sensor is uh, a coplanar waveguide uh, realized in gold on top of a quartz substrate and uh, on which we are placing, placing a, a microfluidic channel that Perpendicularly placed, uh, in which uh, we are putting uh, the um, liquids to, to to test. So input and output, and uh, with this technique, then um, let me highlight now 
uh, you will see measurements with this uh, test setup. But I just want to uh, stress that you have to consider some constraints because uh, we are measuring living materials. So when we are using um, uh, cells or tissues, we have to keep in mind always that uh, it's constantly changing. Uh, I just uh, give you here uh, the example of cell replication. Uh, it takes a few hours, but it's still changing. Uh, typically, um, mammalian cell is uh, changing in 24 hours, uh, so it, it's still moving a lot. And uh, it has to be measured in a liquid environment, which is rich in ions and nutrients. Uh, and depending on what you are looking at, uh, it can be consumed progressively by the cellular source. So you have to consider that also into your measurements. Um, this material is also heterogeneous. I already mentioned that in the motivation. Uh, and for example, I used to, to talk about humans. We are all humans. But finally, we are all different, uh, having different color of hairs and so on. So it's kind of the same for cells. Uh, they want they, they can be come, they can come from the same line, but they won't react exactly the same. They won't be uh, individually the same, and uh, but similarly. So we have to be very careful about that. So strong measurement cares have to be taken uh, with appropriate biological protocols. And we need absolutely to repeat all our measurements. This is really mandatory. So to perform our measurements, uh, we started uh, taking care of some uh, biological complexity. So starting from biomolecules in uh, solution, uh, going then to uh, more complex uh, device, uh, device, but uh, structures. So and going up to cells, living cells, dead cells, cancer cells. And now we are more and more investigating biological mechanisms. And we'll just give you a few examples of that. And what we are looking at is uh, knowing where microwave biosensing can be really relevant uh, for biologists and physicians. So for that, we developed uh, different microwave and microfluidic biosensors. I already uh, mentioned the uh, Coplano waveguide, uh, which is um, used for typically for biomolecules and uh, also for cell suspensions uh, characterization, which enables the permittivity extraction of these solutions. We have a, in the middle one, uh, in the middle, uh, we have a structure which is based on uh, interdigitated capacitor, uh, used for uh, tens of cells to be measured. And uh, on the right side, you can see uh, a component dedicated to single cell measurements also. In the bottom, you can see also the uh, structures that are more narrowband and uh, which are uh, optimized in terms of sensitivity for molecular analysis to go even further in sensitivity. But I don't have too much time today, so I will mainly focus on um, on cellular analysis. Uh, uh, um, so to talk about the first structure I showed you, the Coplanar waveguide, we developed also some de-embedded technique to really be able to extract the permittivity of the fluid under test. So I won't go deeply into this equation. This is not the purpose. If you want some information, you contact me, or you can look uh, into the paper that is uh, cited here. But uh, roughly uh, speaking, what we do is we get rid, uh, we, we suppress the impact of the accesses on both sides, and we also suppress the, uh, the, um, the impact, electromagnetic impact of the walls uh, to maintain the fluid in place. And then we can uh, directly go to the permittivity of the fluid this way. Um, so with this structure, we were able to uh, extract permittivity of molecules in aqueous solution. So you have here the example of albumin and saccharose. In, uh, in um, blue, uh, you can find the real part of the permittivity. Typically, we are measuring from 40 megahertz to 40 gigahertz. And uh, you have in uh, orange and uh, red, the imaginary part of the permittivity. 
And you see that for these two very different biomolecules, uh, we have very different uh, also uh, spectra, spectra, dielectric spectra. So we can say that we have a certain specificity in the molecular spectra we, we reach. Uh, we looked also at carbohydrates in aqueous solution, and um, for them, they are really close to each other, in fact. So it makes me uh, introduce you uh, a way to, to analyze this uh, when we, we have uh, samples really close to each other. Uh, for instance, so we can really discriminate, of course, the eye water from glucose and maltose. But you see that glucose and maltose uh, are really close to each other, uh, and it's, easy, it's not easy to distinguish uh, them from each other because the um, um, the variation of the permittivity is so large uh, the, that the scale is too, is too large. So uh, we introduced a way to look at uh, the spectra is to use permittivity contrasts. So let me uh, show you. In fact, instead of using uh, the uh, large um, uh, relaxation, uh, and then uh, the large variation of permittivity, uh, we extract, uh, we, we evaluate the contrast by subtracting the uh, uh, permittivity of the reference uh, liquid. Uh, so we perform a delta uh, epsilon. So for molecules, for instance, usually they are in water. So what we do is that we measure uh, molecules in water, and then we, uh, ex we um, su subtract the impact of the permittivity of, uh, of water itself. And for cells, uh, uh, usually we, uh, we perform measurements of cells uh, in uh, culture medium. So then we will suppress, in fact, the impact of the permittivity of the cult culture medium itself. So based on this, uh, you can see that now, uh, even if it's, uh, it's still small but uh, relevant, uh, we can now distinguish both uh, carbohydrates, the maltose and the glucose. Uh, so it's possible to discriminate both. So based on uh, this, we even uh, looked at the sensitivity of the technique toward um, molecular concentration. And I can tell you that uh, this uh, uh, is uh, finally linear, uh, proportional to the, it's linear uh, and proportional to the concentration. If you start at zero, which corresponds finally to the host medium, the, the, water, the eye water, uh, if you increase the concentration, and uh, the highest one we use is 0.555 uh, mole, you see that we can uh, really increase the contrast in terms of permittivity for both uh, real and imaginary parts. So, in a sense, we can do molecular quantif quantification if it's uh, already done uh, before and we know the correspondence. We performed also some measurements with amino acids, and we show here that uh, it's possible to have, we, we can reach different uh, spectra depending on the type of amino acid. So, and it's all, again, uh, we obtain that for um, uh, the real and imaginary part of the permittivity on the entire spectra, up to 40 gigahertz. So we can really distinguish this, uh, this uh, spectrum, uh, which leads to uh, possible molecular identification and a certain specificity of this uh, spectra. So let's move now to toward the cellular analysis. So I just wanted to remind you that finally it's a direct measurement type. Uh, we don't need any specific preparation of the cells except uh, to put them into a fresh culture medium. But it's even not obliged. Uh, it's, uh, we are not using any label or, and uh, we can also perform measurement of cells directly into their cell culture. Uh, indeed, if we look at uh, typical biological medium here uh, uh, on the uh, double uh, epsilon double prime versus frequency, you see in orange this biological medium is uh, in the low frequency range 
highly increasing drastically uh, and um, changing from uh, from compared to the blue line uh, which is the eye water so this is induced by of course the uh, high ionic content of the uh, biological medium and the salt in in the in the solution which is uh, mandatory for for cells and uh, you uh, understand with this drawing that uh, if we are in the microwave range so higher than one, mega, uh, one gigahertz, then we don't need, uh, we can directly measure cells into their biological medium without any trouble. Uh, classically, at lower frequency, people looking at cells are uh, obliged to uh, use different and impoverished medium uh, to look at cells. So this is a very nice um, and important uh, feature of the microwave range analysis. Um, so, like for molecules, we looked at the sensitivity of the, te of the technique to cell concentration. So first, um, uh, what you see here again is that the culture medium is uh, at the zero level on both uh, drawing. There's this frequency, and if you increase the, um, the amount of cells, so for instance, uh, the uh, upper one is uh, 108 million of cells per milliliter into our sensor, so sensor is shown uh, in, in the corner of the slide, so the Coplano Waveguide uh, one. You can see that we can really distinguish the different concentration of cells, which are shown on, on, the, on the right. Um, so, uh, this shows you that we can perform cell quantification finally, quite easily. And um, let me uh, just um, repeat, as I said before, that um, to really be convincing for biologists and physicians to use our technique, uh, we need to, be, to have a high reproducibility in our, in our measurements. So what we did is uh, we prepared also in the team uh, different solutions of the cells and uh, using different sensors. And uh, you see the different marks here in these drawings uh, showing the permittivity, imaginary, and real part at 10 gigahertz. Uh, so for measurements done on different cells, well, the same line, but at different moments, different days, different sensors, and we could reach exactly this, roughly the same um, the same uh, permittivity um, uh, values. And uh, on the right, you can see the standard deviation, in fact, we obtained for these uh, measurements. So it's very nicely repeatable, in fact. So let me uh, move on with uh, also further uh, investigation, this time uh, artificial cell death. So for that, we, uh, we in fact um, realized cellular permeabilization of the external uh, membrane using a detergent called saponine. And uh, it was applied on uh, certain type uh, GO882 uh, lymphoma cells in suspension, so in culture medium. And what you see here in, uh, in green, again, on uh, the real uh, part uh, contrast of the permittivity versus frequency, is the, in green the living cells, and uh, in, uh, in red, the, in fact, the treated cells, so which were finally dead. And uh, you see that the contrast in permittivity is decreasing toward the level of the culture medium, the zero, uh, simply because uh, we have uh, the poration of the membrane, so it's shown on the little drawing um, at the bottom of the slide, and we can have this way uh, uh, an equilibrium between the external and the internal media, uh, which lead to this decrease in, in, uh, in, in contrast. Okay, so uh, let's move on now. I mentioned that uh, we did uh, different um, sensors to reach different um, um, amount of cells. So let's move now to the single uh, single cell one. And uh, so we developed a specific uh, device which enables the uh, characterization of individual cells. Uh, so still the same, uh, similar with a coplanar waveguide, but in the center we have a capacitive gap uh, where 
just on top, we will place the cell to be characterized. And to be sure to uh, trap the cell exactly where we want uh, on top of our capacitive cap, we use the mechanical trap, which is uh, included into the microfluidic channel. And this is performed with a polymer-based technology. So um, here is just the uh, principle of this trap. I won't go too deeply, but uh, in, it, it's working quite simply. In fact, you have uh, um, a cell just coming in front of the trap. Uh, once the trap is uh, uh, loaded with a cell, all the other cells will be deviated due to IO dynamic uh, lines that are deviated. And um, this way, you can only trap one cell. So let me show you with a little movie here, the trapping. Uh, so you see the, the cells. Uh, it must be here, lymphoma cells. And you will see an arrow here and uh, with a cell that is just placed now in the middle here of the trap. So we can really precisely have the cell trapped exactly where we want. So. Um, so, um, uh, individual cells were uh, trapped and measured this way, uh, living cells and dead cells. So let's start first with the living ones, uh, which are uh, seen here uh, in uh, orange versus frequency always. And this time it's not the permittivity we are extracting, but the uh, uh, capacitive contrast. If you want further information, please look at our uh, publication for that. And um, so you see um, many lines which correspond to each one to one cell uh, measured, and uh, so individual cells. And uh, we could uh, get uh, a very nice standard deviation with an, array, an average capacitive uh, contrast of minus 0 0.42 femtofarad, which is uh, very small, in fact, but it's the size of the cell is around uh, 15 micron, and we have to consider also that uh, there's a lot of water inside, and uh, which is not so different from the culture medium itself. So it's very weak, in fact, what we want to look at. And it's even even uh, weaker when uh, the cells are dead. Uh, as uh, uh, so, here the way we made the cell dead dead. Uh, dead is by starvation, simply by um, keeping them in the same culture medium for a while. And at the end, they, are, they have uh, eaten all the nutrients, so there is no nutrients any longer, and they have finished by uh, starving. So, and uh, you see that we can reach uh, another level and discriminate the two populations between living and dead cells uh, very uh, efficiently uh, with a very different uh, uh, capacitive contrast uh, average of uh, minus 0 0.19 femtofarad. Okay, um, what I wanted to mention too here is uh, once you have this, you can also uh, monitor uh, in real time uh, the living of the cell, and especially if you apply a stimulus. Uh, like uh, methanol here, added to the culture medium, then you can um, uh, you can follow in direct uh, the death of the cell. So uh, shifting from the living uh, spectrum in red and going up uh, progressively in few minutes to the uh, uh, to the gray uh, curve. So what is interesting here is we can have access to kinetics of uh, biological processes if we apply different kind of stimulus. Uh, so here it was just an example. And uh, let me uh, move uh, on another kind of uh, possible kinetic we can follow and uh, monitoring. We applied this time uh, uh, another uh, kind of stimulus. So instead of a chemical, here it was uh, a uh, high electrical field used to uh, permeabilize uh, cells. So uh, uh, by uh, placing cells between two electrodes, you can, um, and applying uh, some uh, high field uh, voltage uh, during uh, some um, um, 
sometimes uh, and repetitions, you can uh, you can uh, then uh, uh, permeate the cells. So let me move on. So this was done uh, ex situ between these uh, two electrodes here you have here uh, at the top with a special generator. And um, then uh, the cells were incubated during different time, so uh, measured just after or after three hours, uh, five or seven hours. And, uh, and uh, then the cells were measured with two techniques, um, the, RF1, uh, the microwave one, and also a traditional um, and standard uh, te uh, technique, uh, the flow cytometry. And uh, what uh, is showing you uh, the, sli uh, the, the drawing on the right is finally an excellent correlation between uh, the microwave and the uh, flow cytometry results, which show you that uh, finally, um, even if the technique is not at the uh, maturity level of uh, optical techniques, we can still reach uh, very good efficacy and robustness already. And we can already depicting uh, kinetic effects of cell electroporation. What I want also to mention is uh, um, that uh, we only need few uh, few cells to perform the measurements, whereas the flow cytometry requests um, uh, thousands of cells uh, at a minimum. So um, and. For the last results I wanted to show you, uh, I mentioned uh, mainly in vitro investigation up to now, but uh, the technique also enables in vivo analysis. For instance, for skin cancer diagnosis, so for melanoma, uh, uh, typically uh, this is performed by trained dermatologists with optical uh, microscopy, and you need uh, a confirmation with biopsy. And um, um, to get really a high recovery and survival, you need absolutely to get early diagnosis, which is not often uh, performed. So there's, there's a big, big interest in uh, new non-invasive technique uh, detection techniques. And we are developing some, uh, some devices, so here it's really a pre preliminary work. Uh, with a low-cost portable macro test setup, which was uh, implemented uh, in um, in hospital facilities with sterile environment to perform some in vivo measurements on, uh, on mice. And what we did here, so mice are living, and uh, we, we could obtain a really a distinct uh, results between melanoma and healthy skin. And these uh, were also in very good agreement with uh, immunoanalysis, uh, which reflected uh, higher vascularization and higher water content, in fact, which can be uh, easily accessed with microwave spectroscopy. So to conclude, um, I show you that um, there is really big interest in developing now microwave dielectric spectroscopy for molecular and cellular analysis because we can reach really uh, dielectric activity inside the cells. So it can give biologists and physicians finally new bioparameters, uh, qualitative and quantitative bioparameters. And, uh, and thus uh, also uh, it's compatible with real-time monitoring of biological processes. So it really opens new perspectives, both for fundamental aspects, but also applicative aspects such as uh, in therapy and disease diagnostic. And um, so for me, I really think it's important for uh, the future for ubiquitous uh, healthcare. So let me just give you some other complementary research trends that for me are important. Microwave scanning microscopy, the fact that now we need to also miniaturize all the analyzing system and there are also lots of challenges and big things uh, ongoing with implants, so uh, which are also related. And uh, you can uh, you can have on the next slide some information where you can uh, find also complementary uh, results, very important in all these uh, conference books and publications. So thank you very much for your attention, and um, I give you. Uh, uh, and give the mic to, to Dr. Hamilton.
Great. Thank you very much, Katia. That was a quite interesting talk, and uh, it looks like this is really progressing and shows a lot of promise. Uh, so now it's time for our question and answer session. Uh, we've received quite a few questions, so hopefully we'll be able to get to your, to your question. Uh, but before we do start this, remember that you can still submit your questions through the, the question and answer pan, uh, panel. All right, so here's our, our first question in, in uh, no particular order. Um, but there's several questions here about uh, the impact of calibration and how well that needs to be done, what is the effect of the, of the VNA calibration on the accuracy of the measurements? In fact, it's not really the VNA calibration that is important. Of course, yes, if you if you decrease, um, if you if you performed it as um, as clean as possible, uh, depending of what you want to measure, you will be uh, even cleaner. Uh, but what is really more important is the um, um, the fact that we are doing relative measurements. So uh, we are uh, finally measuring the structure uh, with, the, with the hot medium itself and then with the uh, medium loaded with the uh, biological material. And uh, this way we can really uh, decrease the impact of uh, any uh, VNA uh, problem of calibration. Just through mainly the embedding? Yes. Okay, um, towards the end, uh, you showed the measurements um, with regards to melanoma, but um, is there a big difference between kind of your normal cells and, and abnormal cells? Was that, was that melanoma kind of a, a typical case that you might find for normal versus abnormal? Um, actually, we did. For, for now, we didn't really measure normal cells and, um, and uh, cancer cells. We just performed measurements, for instance, with different uh, uh, population of cancer cells. And um, intrinsically, between healthy and cancer cells, you can uh, have already a, a size, uh, large size difference. Cancer cells are really much larger than uh, normal cells. So, we can expect, uh, based on this already, uh, high uh, discrimination between both. And the more tricky part, finally, is to be able to discriminate different subpopulation of cancer cells, not between healthy and cancer, but really between different cancer cells to really be able to make then uh, diagnosis. Okay. Okay, there, there's a few questions here that I think I can kind of lump into um, maybe some similar, uh, try to restate some of these. So, so it looks like in some of the spectra, you're seeing some narrow peaks. Are those corresponding to some measurement issue or are there some underlying natural resonances uh, in the structure that you're, that you're measuring? And then also as part of that, are there some resonant structures or resonant features in the spectrum for the cells that could be used to help you do this distinguishing that you're mentioning? I'm not sure I got uh, all the questions, so maybe I will ask you to, re to repeat. But um, to, I just put the slide here for cells, living cells, for instance, at the individual state. Yes, we have small peaks uh, because, uh, in fact, we are not far from the well, we not far from the noise uh, level, and um, um, you you need still time, and uh, you need to figure to to figure out which um, uh, EF bandwidth and so on of your VNA to use to decrease this kind of um, peaks uh, you can reach in in the in the spectrum. And uh, depending on that, you, you, you can have a very smooth, uh, uh, very smooth uh, spectrum, but uh, sometimes it's not so useful if you want to just have a, a snapshot of your cell. Okay, all right. So those, so those don't necessarily correspond to features of the cells that you're characterizing. It's more of a measurement issue. Yes, yes. And you have to check that uh, 
what we are looking at is extremely small. In fact, it's in terms of uh, femto, well, it's 0.4 femtofarad, for instance, for living cell here, uh, uh, the best for the contrast, capacitive contrast. So it's really small, very, very weak. And uh, even if we, we, we are able to, um, to look at even weaker uh, differences, but uh, then you can't avoid uh, on the spectrum this kind of um, little ripper, in fact. Six. Okay. Okay. Then I think maybe this uh, is kind of along the same vein, maybe just a little bit different. Uh, but there's a question here about uh, that, that, that these measurements can be done quite fast. And is there a chance to do some pulse mode or some time-dependent measurements? And could you extract uh, possibly some more meaningful data from those results? Have you looked at any mm, of that? Certainly, yes. It's, a, it's an interesting point, yes. There are sure uh, richness in looking at that, but um, right now we didn't do that yet. But sure, uh, I'm pretty sure there will be uh, some interesting feature um, to, to look at with with cells and molecules, yes. Okay. Uh, there's lots, lots of questions here about the kind of, I would say, the calibration side of things. So th this one is an, an interesting aspect as well. So how do you deal with temperature and low frequency drifts in your measurements? So on the prop station, you're right. Uh, I uh, didn't mention that we have um, a thermal check. So uh, we perform always our measurements uh, at the same temperature with this uh, thermal check. And also, we are using uh, microfluidic channels. So in fact, um, the temperature of the, um, of the substrate is, uh, well, how to say, um, um, the, the temperature of, your, of the liquid insert, inserted into the microfluidic channel is uh, modified very rapidly. Uh, due to the impact of the check and also the uh, environment, so it's quite stable in temperature. But we we uh, we really um, do our measurements always at the same temperature with a check controlled. Yes, it's important with cells if you want to get uh, high repeatability. Yes. Right. Okay. And I think this next question may may be kind of along the same vein as well. It says, when one liquid is used inside the channel, before adding the next liquid, what is the procedure undertaken to clean or wash the channel? Is there a ah. procedure that you can... Yes, there is a procedure that has been uh, developed. Um, uh, so I'm not doing the measurements myself any longer, but typically when the uh, cells are inserted in the, into their culture medium, uh, then uh, between the different samples, there are um, measurement again of the um, culture medium itself between the different measurements. So uh, cells are measured, then the culture medium, and then again another sample of cells and so on. Okay. Yes. To be uh, sure then to have always the same uh, reference. Right, right, very, very important for that repeatability. Let's yes. see, um, what other features could you use as the output other than the imaginary and real parts of the primitivity? Is there anything else that could be used? Um, um, I'm not sure I clearly understand this question. Uh, there is uh, certainly high richness in the um, in the spectrum uh, itself, um, extracting the relaxation frequency and the plateaus and um, this is what is typically done by a physicist uh, with a broadband electric spectroscopy. And um, uh, I'm sure we could, we, we could find further information if we uh, go further, further into the um, analysis of this uh, spectra. Yes. Right, okay. But okay. after uh, having something else from uh, perm from the permittivity, uh, no, these are our readouts with the relaxation frequency. Uh, yes, no, I don't see any anything else. Okay. Um, and then I think this, so this one cl would just be a little clarification. So for the cancer 
uh, or the melanoma measurement that was done, was that a one port measurement? For, for, for which one, sorry? For, for the, for the for melanoma. The uh, ah, for the, the, the last one, sorry. Yeah, for the last so one. Can you repeat your a, question, sorry? Yeah, yes, so, for this so, one, yes. For the, there, there were kind of multiple sets of measurements. There was one using the coplanar waveguide, and I'm assuming that was two-port measurement? Yes, for cellular suspension uh, analysis, uh, this was a two-port analysis. Here in this case, for in vivo analysis, uh, we are doing a flectometry, so it's a single port uh, measurement. Okay, okay, I got you. That was some, some clarification that was needed. Yes, um, and this kind of uh, probe is a microstrip uh, type of probe, not a coplanar okay. web guide any longer. Yeah. Okay. Okay, all right, and then this, this may be the last question here. Um, actually, it's uh, a combination of two. Um, so I guess there's some concern about harmful effects, the possible possibility of harmful effects of, of microwaves on, on living organisms and living tissue. Um, but the other part of the question is, have you observed any effects of, the, of that power, of the signal intensity? So that kind of spans some space between, you know, low power and, and high power. Can you make any comments about um, impact of, of power on your measurements as well as impact of power mm -hmm. on the health of the tissue? Okay. So we, we also are working uh, on um, microwave effects in the team. So it's uh, performed with other kind of... Um, applicators this time, uh, and we are using with this uh, different range of power. Uh, and what I can say is for sensing, we are really extremely far from what is used usually for, for, uh, for cell phones or any uh, SAR um, uh, requirements. So we published a so paper, I think it was in um, uh, IMS uh, 2012, if I remember well, uh, it was uh, um, uh, dealing with different power we applied on cells and also changing the temperature uh, inside the channel uh, that was uh, changing. And we, we couldn't see any effect on the cells at low power, low power uh, used for sensing. And after, after uh, increasing the power, of course, you can uh, then reach uh, thermal effects, and then you can uh, have a, a dramatic effect on the cells if you, if you cure them, of course. But uh, we are really further below the limits. Okay. So there's a paper for that uh, in okay. IMS uh, 2012. Yeah, you can find the data right, so for the that. Audience should be able to go find that. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we are essentially out of time here. We do still have a few number, uh, a few questions in the queue, and the presenter will follow up on those unanswered questions offline. So uh, as we said earlier, um, sorry, as we said earlier, this session will be archived on the Society website at mtt.org, and all the registrants will get an email reminder uh, with a website address when it's available. For the attendees who would like to receive the PDH credits, please follow the link in the webcast view and use the code that's provided on the last side, slide of this presentation, which is the slide that's being uh, shown right now. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Grenier for an excellent and informative presentation. Special thanks to our audience for joining us today. We hope you found today's event valuable and that you'll return for future IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcasts. Thank you very much and have a pleasant day. Well, thank you, Dr. Hamilton, for moderating the discussion too.